In this sermon, Pastor David explains the source of our unity, and the means by which we maintain it. He addresses the necessity of being on guard against fleshly attitudes and behaviors, while simultaneously cultivating spirit-enabled attitudes and behaviors. Lord God, we need your help. Lord, we need your spirit to move in our midst, to take the truth of your word, and to write it upon our heart. Lord, we pray that you would you would help us to delight in your truth. Empower us to walk in your ways. Lord, help us to, to focus upon the truth of your word. Help me not to be a distraction, but to simply herald these glorious truths. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, on our honeymoon, Leslie and I got to go to the Redwood Forest along the coast of California. Uh, it really is uh, a, a almost magical place. It's, it's incredible. These trees, they're hundreds and hundreds of feet tall. You can't actually see the top from, from the bottom, right? There's just all these branches, and they're all close to one another. Um, they uh, have these diameters. They're huge. So some of them are 10 and 12 feet wide. They've, they've hollowed out trunks. Leslie and I drove our car through one of these trees that's still standing and living strong. Uh, they've been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. There's some of them that have been there for over a thousand years. I mean, just think about all that happens in, over all those centuries, all the storms that came against those trees, and yet here they are. They're still standing. Now, interestingly, when, when you take a redwood and you, you plant it somewhere else, a redwood that's in isolation, it doesn't grow nearly as tall nor last nearly as long. They only last like this in the forest. And the secret to their endurance, to their strength, is in their root system. You know, for trees that might be 300 feet tall, it's pretty crazy that their roots don't go any deeper than 12 feet into the ground. But what they do is they spread out. And as they do, they intertwine with one another. The trees in the forest are literally holding on to one another. So as the storms come, they stand firm together. The forest is united. Well, in a similar way, the people of God, we endure together. We stand firm as we hold on to one another. The text of scripture we've come to this morning is commanding us to earnestly preserve the unity of the people of God. We're in Ephesians 4. We're going to focus on verses 3 to 6, but I'm going to go back and read from the beginning of the chapter. So Ephesians 4, hear now the word of the Lord, God's holy, perfect, inerrant, infallible word. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. This is the word of the Lord. This passage is about unity. It's about the unity of the people of God, unity of God's family, the unity of the church. This morning I want us to consider three questions together. The first is this, what is unity? Unity is, is oneness, it's togetherness, it's being joined into a complete whole. Unity refers to being in agreement, being of one accord, being on the same page. So we see unity when people are working together for a common goal. So think of a, a big factory. You've got this assembly line, and there's all the different people working at all their different jobs, and yet together they're producing this one product. Or think of an athletic team. You've got all the players, they're playing different positions, they're in some respect doing different things, and yet they're all working for the same thing. They want to win. They literally want to, to get the goal. 
So let's think together about Christian unity. We are supposed to have unity. We're supposed to be united around the gospel of Jesus Christ. So look there at verse 3, and then let's make an observation together. In verse 3, we're commanded to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Notice that we're not commanded to create this unity. We're not to manufacture this unity. We're told that the unity already exists. Our job is simply to maintain that unity. So every true believer is bound to every other true believer. We belong to one another. We are the family of God. And yet the command here is to to take good care of that family, to, to preserve it to maintain it. Our job is to to keep it together. So there's the first question. What is unity? Now secondly, and we'll spend a long time on this question, how do we maintain unity? How do we maintain the unity of the body of Christ? How do we maintain unity in the church? Well, how do you maintain a vehicle? Well, you, you, you make sure there's enough oil so there's not too much friction. You do various forms of preventative maintenance so that you can keep that vehicle running. Well, our relationships need preventative maintenance, right? We need to spend time together. And when we spend time together, we're supposed to live with the virtues that we looked at last week. Back in verse 2. Look at verse 2 again. We are to live together with all humility and gentleness, with patience Bearing with one another in love. See, God intends for us to spend regular time together, and not just for an hour on Sunday morning, but to actually share our lives and to be doing so with humility, with gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another's failings, loving each other. So we're supposed to pursue peace. We're supposed to live in harmony But that's really only half the task. What else do we need to do in order to preserve unity? Well, the word here translated as maintain could also be translated preserve, keep, guard. It's translated in in that way various times. And it's really one of these things where you just kind of want it all together. If you have something valuable, you work hard to protect it. So picture Soldiers, they want to protect their fort. So how do they go about that? What do they do? Well, they keep watch. They guard it with vigilance. We are supposed to guard our unity. We are to keep the unity that we have. We are to preserve it. So how do we do that? We we watch out. We keep on guard for anything that would divide us. Anything that would separate us. So there's two ways we preserve unity, by seeking to live in harmony and by seeking to avoid that which would separate us, avoiding division. I'm going to go to several different passages this morning to show that this is the consistent teaching of the New Testament. Over and over again, we are called to these twin realities. We are to preserve the unity by seeking unity and by avoiding disunity. So here's 1 Corinthians, 10, or 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. Paul writes, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree. So there's the command for unity. All of you agree. And that there be no division among you. He's just saying it both ways. <laughs> agree with one another and don't disagree. Be unified. Don't be separated. He continues, but that all of you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Or listen to Philippians 2. It was read earlier in the service. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. He's basically said the same thing four times. He's telling us to be unified. But then notice what he says next. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also the interest of others. I think what Paul is saying there is simple. 
Unity thrives where pride dies. Right? As long as we are arrogant and focused upon ourselves and concerned with our rights and our agenda and our plans, well, unity can't survive. But when people in humility start putting others before themselves, now the whole can, can press on. We need to avoid selfishness. We need to avoid pride. We need to be careful not to take sides against one another. To say it differently, we need to avoid the works of the flesh. That's how Paul describes it in Galatians 5. Again, he's discussing this issue of Christian unity. Listen to the image he begins with. This is Galatians 5 verse 15. If you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. They are opposed to one another. So he begins with this image of cannibals eating one another. And he says, this destroys the unity of the church. We cannot be biting and devouring one another. And then he lists for us what he calls the works of the flesh. It's a long list, but in the midst of the list there's eight Right next to one another, I want to read them for you. So in verse 19, it says this. Now the works of the flesh are enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. This is a list of things that divide us, that separate us. These are things that break us apart. And we've all been involved in each of these things. We've been envious. We've been jealous. There's been times when we've been angry with one another. It's easy to to end up in these rivalries, these divisions. We've got our team, and there's what we think, and there's that other group over there. It's easy to be contentious, to be those who who are ready to fight for what we are convinced of. But here we're told that these enemies, these works of the flesh, they are the enemies of true unity. We must diligently oppose these sinful actions. So we need to avoid the sins of the flesh, the works of the flesh. But at the same time, he calls us to walk by the Spirit. And we shouldn't be surprised by that language at all. Because did you notice in our text, if you've got Ephesians there, look back to verse 3. Be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. You see, Christian unity is not merely human unity. It's not something we created. It's a spiritual unity. It's a supernatural unity. God has created something that is beyond us. And God uses the work of the Spirit to preserve the very unity of the Spirit. It's the attitudes and the behaviors that the, steward, that the Spirit produces in us that preserve that unity. Later in Galatians 5, he calls it the fruit of the Spirit. Notice that the word fruit is singular. It's not that there's a bunch of fruits. No, it's one fruit that has these different characteristics. All of this is what the Spirit produces in his people. So Galatians 5 verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Oh, what an opposite list. We've seen these things that divide us. And here are loving actions that bind us together, that hold us together. And that list is very similar to the shortened version we have in our passage. So go back to Ephesians 4. In the middle of verse 1, he says, I urge you, To walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And here's the list. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So over and over again throughout the New Testament, what we're seeing is that the way that we preserve Christian unity is by being on guard against fleshly attitudes and behaviors while simultaneously cultivating the Spirit-enabled attitudes and behaviors. 
There's, there's these two ways to live. We're to forsake one and pursue the other. So specifically, we're commanded here to walk in humility with gentleness, with patience. We're to bear with one another in love. So conversely, that means we are not to walk with one another in pride, in harshness, in impatience, in intolerance, in hatred. Those things must be rejected that we might do the others. Or again, from Galatians, we must reject enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, and envy. And at the same time, we need to be intentionally relating to one another with the fruit of the Spirit. We should be filled with love and joy and peace, patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. There's two prongs to this attack. We forsake ungodly attitudes and we embrace godly ones. We put off unrighteousness and we put on righteousness. One more text. Colossians 3 He uses this language of put off and put on. In verse 8, he writes this. Now you must put them all away. Here's the list of what to be rejected. He says, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. Now he shows us the second side. And you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Then he describes our beautiful unity in verse 11. He says, here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. What he's saying there is, okay, yes, you are still Greek or Jewish or all these different things, and yet those things aren't what really matter. We are one, we're united in the Messiah. So then he continues with what we put on. Verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So how do we maintain unity? We do it in two ways. By avoiding division and by seeking harmony. In Sunday school, right now we're studying from a 300-year-old book by John Owen. The title is Duties of Christian Fellowship. In that little book, he describes three different kinds of unity and our responsibility towards each. He notes that we must endeavor to preserve unity between individual Christians. Secondly, we must endeavor to preserve unity in the local church. And then third, we must endeavor to preserve unity, the universal unity between all Christians. So we are commanded to get along with one another, with the church, and with all believers. So I want us to just slow down for a minute and think through what this looks like. So this means that husbands and wives refuse to let their different opinions lead to bitterness and anger. It means that Christians are to give one another the benefit of the doubt. We're not to assume wrong motives. When we've been wrong, we're to forgive one another. When you realize that you have offended someone, you should take the initiative and go apologize. You should seek to be reconciled. We need to be those who work out our differences, even major differences, major disagreements. The scripture tells us we can never resort to lawsuits. No, we must find a way to work things out between individual Christians. We we have to get along. We can't just let that argument fester and get worse. No, we must deal with it. Or think about that second category, among the church. We need to strive for unity among the local body. So that means that our local church should refuse to be jealous or envious of other churches. Along the same line, we need to be careful not to be prideful, as if we're the only church that's doing things right, as if we can look down upon everyone else. 
we need to be careful that we do not gossip and complain. We want to love our church well. And so we have differing opinions, and we need to be able to discuss those with one another. But what we don't need to do is go off into our little groups and start kind of working up a division where now we're against this group over here. No, we, we do these things together. We, we come together. We, we vote on things together. We, we discuss things together. We support the work that's going on here. It means that we're, we're those who, who volunteer, who serve. We, we see a need. We don't just say, yeah, somebody should do something about that. We say, I'm a somebody. I can do something about that. We jump in. We offer aid. We need to seek to get along with individuals, with the local church, and even with others. We should seek as a church to cooperate with other churches. We should say, what could we do better together than we can do alone? So, for example, this summer, eight different like-minded, gospel-focused churches put on kids camp. That was a wonderful example of Christian unity. Or Good News Club. This fall, there's going to be volunteers from 15 different churches in our area that are all working together to make the gospel clear to a bunch of children up at the elementary school. What a great example. We should be open to ways that our church can work with other churches for the sake of the gospel of Christ. We want to be those who get along for the glory of God. Not only do we need to maintain this unity, the text is more precise than that. It says that we are to be eager to maintain it. Look again at verse 3. Be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. This means that Christians, we need to be doing everything that we can that this unity would hold together. We need to be striving. We need to be earnest about this. We're, we're longing to see it come to pass. Why? Well, why does he not just say, make sure everything's working? Why does he say, be eager? Well, I think he's telling us to simply imitate Christ. Jesus, the night before he died, he prayed earnestly that our unity would be preserved, that it would endure. In John 17, we have this incredible prayer. He's praying for his disciples, and listen to what he prays. John 17, verse 11 says this, I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Sometimes a Bible verse just kind of hits you like a two-by-four. Did you catch what he just asked for? Jesus is earnestly praying that his knucklehead disciples would be characterized by the same unity as the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Their oneness would be shown in the oneness of the people of God. And it's not just the 11. It's not just the disciples. Look down to verse 20. John 17, verse 20. Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So that's us. Jesus, the night before he died, he was praying for all Christians. He's praying for us. And here's his prayer in verse 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be in us. So the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory you have given to me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them you and me, that they may become perfectly one. That the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Jesus understands that Christian unity shows the world the gospel on display. We should be eager to maintain unity for the sake of Christ. If he was passionate about this, we had better be passionate about the same thing. So come back to our text. Verse 3, eager to maintain the unity of spirit 
in the bond of peace. So think with me, what is the glue that holds us together? What is the bonding agent? Well, he tells us it's peace. The opposite of peace is hostility, arguing, fighting. But peace, on the other hand, it has at its root love for one another, a concern for one another. And that love is what produces the peace that holds us together. Peace is like like a belt that binds the people of God tightly together. Oh, that we would pursue peace, that we would seek to live in harmony. We are to strive for agreement. We need to work towards like-mindedness. In Romans 12, Paul puts it this way. He instructs the church, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. I appreciate that he put in there, as far as it depends on you. He's reminding us that sometimes we just can't get along. But we are all commanded to be the one who's pursuing peace, who's seeking to be in harmony. If the argument continues, it should be the other person's fault because we're doing everything we possibly can to be at peace. Or later in chapter 14, he writes this, verse 19, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Uh, This is a tall task. We need to seek to maintain unity by avoiding division and striving to be together. We've talked about what unity is, about how we pursue it, how we maintain it, preserve it. But finally, I want us to consider the source of our unity. What is the source of the unity? Where does this come from? Well, Paul tells us in the next three verses, in rapid fire, he's going to give us seven reasons why this unity must be maintained. Seven motivations for our diligence. It's the sevenfold basis of our unity. Just one sentence, verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Boy, that's worth memorizing. Those are beautiful words, speaking of the unity that we have with one another. The word one is repeated seven times. So let's consider Each in turn. First, there is only one body. He's referring here to the body of Christ, to the church. Many metaphors are used here. He's referring to us as the body. This is a reference not to just a local church, but the universal church. There is one body. This is part of what we celebrate when we take communion. In just a few moments, we're going to take communion together. And we call it communion because we're celebrating the communion of saints. The fact that we are one. We are united because of what Christ has done for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says this, verse 16, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And then he says this, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. He's pointing us to the symbolism that takes place in communion. When we all share this one bread together, we're reminding ourselves that we are one. We are united in Christ. Again, in chapter 12, he writes this. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. For just as the body, and here he's just speaking about the human body. He's introducing the metaphor. For just as the body is one and has many members... And all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. So now we see, okay, he's he's now referring to us as the body of Christ. And then he says this, verse 13. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. But we share this truth together. We are one body. Next in our text, there is only one spirit. This is a reference to the Holy Spirit, the one who indwells believers. There is one body, 
one spirit. And then he says, one hope. This hope that belongs to our calling. What is the the one and only hope that we share together? What unites us is that we have a common hope. This is a reference to our salvation. Our blessed hope is that Jesus, the Savior, is returning to take us to be with him forever. That is our hope. The one hope is that we will be with him always. In verse 5, he continues, now going even faster. He says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. The one Lord is a reference to Jesus Christ. He is the only Lord. Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. Paul writes in Romans 10, The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. So we have one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith. This isn't referring to how each of us individually believe. It's referring to what we all believe. This one faith is the content of Christian doctrine. It is the truth. It's what Jude 3 refers to. He calls us to contend for the faith, once for all delivered to the saints. There is one faith. It's contained right here in the words of Scripture. What we believe, the truth, is the faith faith. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Christians all share in the same initiation rite. People repent and believe and then they are baptized. This is the sign of of obedience that we're walking in Jesus. Jesus commanded that we would make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Christians all share the one baptism. Finally, in verse 6, there is one God and Father of all, who's over all, through all, and in all. As Christians, we are now members of the one family of God. And we don't all have a separate father. No, now we have the one Father, our Father in heaven, the one we pray to. Jesus is our, or the Father (laughs) is our one Father. So these seven things, they unite us. These are the the very foundation of Christian unity. These are seven things that Christians all hold in common. And and what are they? They are the fruits of the gospel. If you want to just simplify it down, here it is. What unites us is the gospel of Christ. God in his great love sent Jesus who lived a perfect life then died a substitutionary death in the place of sinners so that anyone who repents and believes could become a member of the one body by the regenerating work of the one spirit unto the one hope, following after the one Lord, confident in our one faith, participating in that one baptism in the family of God under one Father. You see, the gospel is what brings us together. And brothers and sisters, the gospel is what keeps us together. It must always be central. If we have these glorious seven truths in common, we can never let anything separate us. We have one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Father of all. Therefore, we must be one. We must be unified. We can't let anything separate us. Unity is not an option for Christians, it's essential that we are unified. In fact, it's essential to the very message that we proclaim. So here's what we've seen this morning. God intends for us to share our lives together and for us to be united, for us to be partners in the gospel, for us to be co-workers for the sake of Christ. We are working together for the glory of God in the gospel of Christ. God has planted us like trees into a forest. And we are to be intertwined. We are to be knit together in love. We are to hold on to one another for the sake of the gospel. We're all tempted to let our opinion, our pride cause division. We need to see that for what it is. It is an enemy of the gospel of Christ. Oh, that we would be united We need to support one another and work together towards this common goal. So my prayer for our church is simple. 
Oh, that we would be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let me conclude with the words of 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Paul, at the end of his letter, writes this. Finally, brothers, agree with one another and live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Let's pray together. Lord, we are astounded that you would take people from different races and different continents, different languages, different life experience, different incomes, different issues, different troubles, different successes, and you bring us all together in the people of God. You unite us by the death of your Son. You forgive us our sins. You make us your own children. Lord, we are so thankful for the unity we have in Christ. Lord, we pray that you would make us zealous, make us eager to preserve that unity. Help us to work hard to maintain Christian unity. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. As Christians, we must protect our unity by avoiding division and by pursuing peace. You'd think it would be easy for people who have the spirit of the living God dwelling in them. But history has shown the struggle the church has had with division. Tomorrow, we tackle Ephesians 4, 7-12, and discover the unique ways God has made us to serve Him, and one another.